Now remember logical fate or logical destiny. And notice how subtle these unconscious assumptions are. In California, a psychiatric patient was asked if he were Napoleon. He craftily said no. A lie detector showed that he was lying. <laughs> well, you can say one thing, but what you really mean is something else again. And I'm against Kennedy, said one retired Atlantic, uh, Atlanta Railroad engineer, but I'm not going to explain why. You might be a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Your problems and my problems stem from the false assumptions we have about others, we have about ourselves, we have about the tools we are working with. This is why we have accidents. The man who assumes the stepladder will hold him when it doesn't. The truck driver who assumes his brakes will work when they won't. This is the semantics of accidents. And the accidents are not caused by mechanical failures as much as the false assumptions up here. So if in this first half session I can make you conscious of your unconscious assumptions, this is all that we expect so far, then we will build some building blocks toward sanity rather than unsanity. And again, unfortunately, this is not taught to us in our colleges and universities. The only ones who basically deal with this, and it'll cost you 30 to $40 an hour to get this kind of training, is where? Psychiatry. Where they dig out the unconscious assumptions that are deep in our subconscious mind, that are repressed, that are unconscious or subconscious. But we are trying to do this to make some of them conscious on a more pragmatic, on a more practical level. Okay, let's quickly go down. Number four, the robber should have hit jo Jim Jones harder before he had a chance to turn around. False. The robber landed on the sidewalk and did not succeed in his attempt. Don't know. Some of you answered true to that? I'm sure some of you did. But it should be don't know if you're going to be scientific in your ways of thinking. Now, I'm not saying, and I will not say at the conclusion, that we have to be this technical all the time because you know the kind of guys who are too technical, etc. But what I am saying, if need be, you can be this technical so that you do not lose time, money, energy, create arguments, fights, disagreements. If you need to be scientifically, psychologically, you are able to do so. But too many of us are sloppy in our thinking. Too many of us do what Wendell Johnson says, we do the kind of thinking where we don't do any thinking. And we want to do better thinking with a higher degree of predictability. All right, number six, Jim should not have struck the man. Don't know. Is that what you say? But my tendency would be what? What should that answer be? True. For the first time again, we do have an ethical or moral implication. Now, it's true scientifically or technically that that would be don't know. But when I say it's true, Jim should not have struck the man. What I'm saying is this. Instead of striking the man, it is more intelligent to pause, to delay, to look and see who it is first. This is what I mean by a true answer. Okay, let's go to the other one with number one through five and one through five. Which girl do you think is more beautiful? Number one, how many of you have A? All right, and how many of you had uh, B? All right, number one was A, Diane Darling. Who had A? Why did you have Diane Darling? It's a very pleasing sound. <laughs> it's a very pleasing sound? Yes. All right. Now, we're talking about intelligent behavior. And my question was, which girl do you think is more beautiful? What's that? I don't know any of them, so I couldn't... You don't know any of them? No. They must have been in those earlier movies. I thought I knew one of them. Didn't you say Paula Aardvark? Paula Aardvark, you knew? Yeah. 
Now this was Fedora. <laughs> yes. All right. In other words, what you are saying is it's a little more intelligent to go by facts rather than words. Right? One of your stipulations was answer yes, no, or any way you want. You answered A. Okay. <laughs> That's the wrong answer. <laughs> From this point of view. <laughs> yes. That's the correct answer. From this point of view. Can you intelligently answer these questions? No. no. Now what am I talking about? I am saying, and this is what we are concerned with in general semantics that you and I have two different ways of behaving or responding. Number one, we can behave this way toward the nonverbal facts. Let's say that these or this is the nonverbal level, the world of facts. Here you have words or verbal associations. Now there is one way of responding to people, to situations and things, if you respond to them via or in terms of the label. And most of the people in our culture respond to people, situations, and things around them via or in terms of a label. These are the verbally oriented people. The verbally oriented people. In general semantics we call this an intentional orientation but I don't have time to give you an entire course on it. Let's call this the verbally oriented people. Are you verbally oriented? And I think you would agree that you are, I am, most of us are. Why? Because our educational institutions confuse words with facts. The general semanticist says if you want to be scientific, if you want to be factually oriented, you and I must respond to facts or individual people, situations, and things. Not in terms of the label, but I want to learn how to respond to people, situations, and things in terms of the nonverbal fact, not in terms of the label. Put a label on a person and, brother, you've got them. Negro, Catholic, Jew, any word you want. We are verbally oriented. And the important thing is this. Can you and I learn to separate words and things? That's why I had you pinch your finger and ask you to tell me what you felt. The word is not the thing. And don't worry about the labels that other people put on you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, etc. Words will hurt you only if you allow words to hurt you. But remember, the word is not the thing. All right? Why are we concerned with this? Because, again, you and I are living in a very superficial world. We are not very scientific. We jump to conclusions because our ways of thinking, communicating, and behaving are more verbally oriented than factually oriented. For example, what do we mean by a misevaluation and something that we will call stupidity in contradistinction to intelligence? Now, this is animalistic behavior. But you and I behave the same way as, let's say, a northern pike. Take a uh, bull, pale, separate it with a glass, uh, put water in, inside, separate with a pane of glass, Put a northern pike on this side and put some minnows on this side. And what will the northern pike try to do? Now notice this is situation one. These are the nonverbal facts. And again, my basic question so far is this. Is your life, is my life, are our lives going to be oriented in terms of facts 
or in terms of words, inferences, assumptions, the verbal world of reality or the non-verbal world of reality? That's the crucial question that the general semanticist is concerned with. And you can ask that question no matter what job you are involved in. You can ask that question if you are in involved in human relations, communication, management, school teacher, parent. Are you factually oriented or are you verbally oriented? The men who work for you, are they factually oriented or are they verbally oriented? And if they are verbally oriented, you better do something about their having training so that they will get factually oriented. If you are a teacher, are your students verbally oriented or are they factually oriented? And if they are verbally oriented, because our educational systems create verbal orientations. See, children are born factually oriented. Take a little boy who goes to kindergarten and the teacher will say to little Johnny, look, Johnny, look at the cow. That's a cow. <laughs> look, Johnny, look at the cow. And Johnny will say, ah, teacher, <laughs> that's a picture of a cow. This verbal, nonverbal confusion is already starting to set in. Little babies, are they born verbally or nonverbally oriented? Nonverbally. They are the most nonverbal of people. They feel. They see things that you and I miss. And this is why a sleight of hand artist, a magician, very often, they can fool little kids. <laughs> Because through disassociation, you and I are looking at the things that the magician wants us to look at. And the little kid says, hey, what are you doing over there, boy? <laughs> there's the chicken, there's the rabbit. But what I'm saying is this. We confuse words with things. We substitute words for things. This is why we have so many problems. Now, this is the factual situation in situation one. What will the northern pike try to do? Try to get at the minnows, right? Okay, the northern pike will try to do it one, two, five, ten, twenty, fifty times. And he knows every time he tries, he will hit his nose up against the pane of glass. And sooner or later, the northern pike will quit. That's situation one. At least it has enough intelligence to quit. It's not very intelligent to keep knocking your nose up against the pane of glass and getting hurt. Now remove the pane of glass. Notice you have changed the facts tremendously. And the minnows can float all around the northern pike. This is situation two. And you can do this in your own, if you want to verify what I'm saying, do this at home. You will allow the minnows to swim all around, even bumping up the northern pike. But the northern pike knows what it knows. And if you leave them there long enough, it will literally die of starvation. This, my friends, is stupidity. This is animalistic behavior. The inability to change our ways of thinking to fit the changing facts. See the picture of this man and the lock on his head, locked tight. Well, to what degree do you and I do the same kind of thinking? Whether about our interpersonal relations with husband, wife, children. Oh boy, do we need a course in communication. In fact, the last course I offered, I talked to the individuals here. And one of these days, and I don't know when, but I should really offer a course of effective communication between parents and children. Boy, is that needed. Because of the generation gap, because of the semantic misevaluations inherent in who? The kids? In, in the parents? In both, actually, right? Both are guilty. As you and I are both guilty if there are semantic misevaluations. The burden for effective communication in business and industry or everyday life is upon who? The speaker or the listener? The speaker? 
both, as we will see. Okay, so this is what we mean by stupidity. Notice how human beings can fall into this trap, too. During a heavy flood, a girl was perched on top of a house with a small boy. As they watched uh, articles float along, they noticed a derby hat on the water. Presently, the hat turned and came back, then turned again and went downstream. After it went away, it turned and came back again. The little girl said, Do you see that derby? First it goes downstream, then it turns and comes back. The boy replied, Oh, that's father. He said, Come hell or high water, I'm going to cut the grass today. <laughs> well, there's something wrong with that way of thinking. Thirty years ago, we used to call this stubbornness. Today, we know it as stupidity. We will go into the most important barriers to effective communication or intelligent behavior. Now, it's not only a case of ignorance, you see, relative to communication. Unfortunately, we are not taught these communication principles. And there are some very, very simple operational principles that we can all learn. Whether we're talking about communication or, let's say, sex education. Because, you know, the trouble with Adam and Eve was not a red apple, but a green pear. <laughs> Let's take a break. <laughs> what we have attempted to do so far is to give some of the quizzes to show how students, how executives, teachers, how all of us jump to conclusions, have false assumptions, project meanings into situations, in other words, how we all fall victim to the different barriers to effective communication. We will now go into the first barrier to effective communication. Now, no matter what your job is, whether you are an executive, a teacher, a salesman, you probably don't recognize it in yourself, but you might very well recognize it in others. The first barrier to effective communication is what we call in general semantics the signal reaction. This is an automatic, trigger-like reaction, impulsive behavior, the tendency to respond too quickly. Wisdom, however, begins when we can recognize it in ourselves. I call it the first barrier to effective communication because it is this automatic, trigger-like, impulsive reaction that leads to other barriers to effective communication and intelligent behavior. It is important that we analyze this first barrier to effective communication, number one, because we all fall victim to it. It is so prevalent in human relations, in business and industry, in communication. It is also an important causative factor of other barriers to effective communication, such as jumping to conclusions, misunderstanding, snap judgments, not training ourselves in seeing people, situations, and things adequately. There are many other barriers to effective communication and intelligent behavior that result from this tendency of responding too quickly, of having an impulsive, automatic, trigger-like reaction. This is called the signal reaction in general semantics. There are three kinds of behavioral reactions. Number one, there is a simple reflex action. And although some of you might think that I'm getting a little technical, I think you will see that the things that we will be talking about tonight have tremendous practical values for you on the job or in interpersonal relations. Number one is a reflex action. If I shine a light into the pupil of your eye, what will happen? Dilate, close, constrict, etc. Hit the patellar tendon of the knee and you have a knee jerk. Hit the plantar tendon at the base of the foot, you have a simple reflex action. In other words, this is quick, automatic, unconditioned response. It is not learned. It is physiological. If you and I eat certain foods, there are certain gastrointestinal changes. There's nothing we can do about it, basically. Now, we are not concerned with this because, as I've said, there's not much that we can do about it. But we are concerned with the number two kind of a response. 
And this is called a signal reaction. Now this is reflex-like behavior. Reflex-like behavior. This looks like a reflex action. But whereas this is unconditioned, this is learned. You and I have learned to respond in a quick, automatic, trigger-like manner. And all you have to do is look in the newspapers every day. Today, did you see that riot at that soccer tournament? <laughs> Hundreds of people injured. This is what we mean by unsanity. This is human behavior we're talking about. And in the world today, we are finding more and more unsane ways of behaving than we did 40, 50 years ago. And this is what we are concerned with as general semanticists or as teachers. The signal reaction, reflex-like behavior, quick, automatic, trigger-like, or, if you will, unthinking. Unthinking. There is no evaluation. That four phases that we talked about, there is the happening, the nervous impact, and then we jump right over to the talk and or act. There is no human evaluation. And this is why Wendell Johnson, the late Wendell Johnson, who wrote the book People in Quandary, said, this is the kind of thinking we do when we don't do any thinking. Too much of our behavior is simple, automatic, conditioned responses. The reflex action which is also a stimulus and a quick automatic response. For example, a lady in our town who may be best described as a perpetual talker was asked by one of her long-suffering neighbors if she ever thought about what she was going to say before saying it. Why no, said the lady solemnly. How on earth could I know what I think about a thing until I've heard what I have to say on the subject? <laughs> well... Too many of us are like this. We immediately burst out into speech. We don't use the gray matter. We don't use the cortex. We literally lower ourselves to an animalistic way of behaving. This is the animalistic way of behaving. They are a series of conditioned responses. Just watch how animals behave. Simple conditioned responses. For example, when a neighbor telephoned Mrs. Clara Wood of Pocatello, Idaho, that the Wood police dog was romping in her yard, Mrs. Wood told her to put the dog's ear to the phone. Ted, she said, you come right home. Ted was off like a shot and back in his own yard a few minutes later. This is a conditioned response. And this is how I got into hypnosis. Because in this part of my lecture at Northwestern and the University of Chicago, what is the most extreme form of language controlling human behavior? Hypnosis. The most extreme form of the conditioned response. Now, if you and I are so conditioned as robots by a public speaker, and if you read Esther Brooks' book on hypnotism, he has a whole chapter on Adolf Hitler... This is not out of the question for us to get a demagogue on television and you and I can be controlled and conditioned just like that. So, although I used to teach, again, public speaking and the psychology of persuasion, and I will talk about psychology of persuasion and selling, we are concerned with how can we persuade others effectively. We must look at the other end of the continuum. How can you and I protect ourselves against the continual bombardment of advertising, public speaking, persuasion, etc. How can you and I learn to say no? Boy, is that important. <laughs> I have to say that so often. We all do. How can we learn to guard against the continual barrage of our language or semantic environment? Automatic conditioned responses. 
A Houston bus driver was trying to make a turn downtown, but a woman driver, apparently unaware of the bus, was moving into a dangerous position. The driver whistled sharply, the woman stopped and looked, and the driver jockeyed his bus through the opening. Asked by a passenger why he had whistled instead of honking, the driver said, about half the woman drivers won't pay any attention to somebody honking, but there ain't a dame in Houston that won't stop and look when she hears a man whistle. Well, this is a simple conditioned response. Here is an example that I think you will agree is what we mean by stupidity. We enlisted men were at bat in a hotly contested baseball game with our officers when a private hit what looked like a single to short right field. Instead of stopping at first, however, he foolishly started a wild dash towards second. Realizing then that he couldn't make it, he scrambled back toward first. Now he was being chased in a rundown between the lieutenant playing first and the colonel playing second. It looked like a sure out, but just as the lieutenant flipped the ball back to the colonel, the private snapped to attention saluting the colonel. Automatically, the colonel snapped the salute back and muffed the catch. <laughs> well... This is what we mean by stupidity. When you and I are so conditioned to respond unthinkingly, what kind of response is appropriate for the human way of behaving? Alfred Korzybski called this a symbol reaction. A symbol reaction. And in the symbol reaction, there is a pause. There is a delay. There is an observation. There is some analysis. And all of you and I have to do the same thing. Whenever we make a decision, you've got to take time. If your decision is going to be truthful, and the modern scientific definition of truth is in terms of probability and predictability. We're not talking about some uh, philosophical or theoretical definition of truth or verbal definition. We're talking about an empirical, extensional definition of truth. And modern definition of truth is in terms of probability or predictability. If your decisions will have a higher degree of predictability, they must be predicated upon facts, not upon inferences, assumptions, false beliefs, etc. Please turn the cassette over for the start of Side B at this point. If your assumptions are going to be predicated upon fact and high, have a higher degree of predictability, you've got to take time to get down to the facts. But one of the reasons that we lose so much time, money, is because our predictions of the future are false. They're based upon false assumptions. We don't take enough time to get down the facts or we don't use other information of other experts. We can't do everything ourselves. Some executives try to do everything themselves. This is a false assumption about themselves and about the empirical situation of business. Because problems multiply so greatly that if you haven't learned to delegate responsibility and the authority that goes with it, and that's important, then you're going to kill yourself early. I'll be talking a little bit about the semantics of happiness, the semantics of getting a lot of energy out of yourself and not killing yourself due to false assumptions about yourself, about what you can do, and the assumption that your job is a very simple, non-complex thing. Because it isn't. And I am caught up myself in this what we call non-additivity. Our jobs multiply in complexity in a geometric ratio. 
And I will talk about that next week when I talk about the semantics of productivity, the semantics of happiness, etc. Okay, proper evaluation is the symbol reaction. This means that we use the gray matter a little more. I'm not going to draw a side view of the brain. But here, if you can visualize with a signal reaction, the nervous impulse com comes up through the body and up into the cortex here. And because of a very quick response, it comes back down into the nervous system where most of the work has been done in the thalamus or the emotional center of the brain. If you pause and delay and analyze a little more, you allow the cortex to play a more human role. And it's the cortex in which we do our thinking, our evaluating, the seeing of differences, etc. This is why we come call some of our friends who are not particularly brilliant bird brains. If you analyze a bird, they have a very small cortex. But you and I can literally lower ourselves to an animalistic way of living or behaving on the job or off the job because we are living in terms of a series of signal reactions, condition responses. Sometimes you might have a president of a company like this. Then don't be surprised if you have problems. And I will be tying these principles up, you see, with communication, with human relations. And in many areas, it's tremendously important for you and I to learn to pause. In making a decision, you may have to take one more day and get more facts. You may have to take two more hours. Or you only have to take five seconds. I am not saying that you should procrastinate. This kind of a philosophy does not say that you wait until all the facts are in. Not at all. Because then things are going to pass you by, boy. But what I am saying is this, that in your responses to other people, you should control the situation. This is what it looks like here. Here's the stimulus, and here is the response. But in between the stimulus and the response is you. You control the situation. The stimulus does not control you. And basically, this is a tremendously important concept. Animals are the ones who truly live in terms of a series of signal reactions. The human being is the only one who can truly live in terms of symbol reactions. Where you pause, you delay, you listen to other people. You do not become over-emotional about things. You use a little bit of the gray matter. And don't we find too many signal reactions in our world today? Not just in the riots. This is what Hayakawa is trying to introduce at San Francisco State. He wants to have a little more of a rational approach. Before you have the war of bullets, we want to substitute the war of words. Because the moment you stop talking, then what follows? Fighting, right? Whether with sticks or stones or bullets or what have you. This is why I think Hayakawa was called in to try to offer some semantic wisdom. That is not a simple situation up at San Francisco State, as some professors or some predecessors of Hayakawa assumed. This is a very, very complex situation, as Hayakawa has realized, and as all of you must realize in any situation that you are in. The world of reality is not simple. It is tremendously complex. But it is the simpleton, literally, who tries to offer simple solutions to very, very complex problems. Some of you may want to take this down. This was given by George Santayana, S-A-N-T-A-Y-A-N-A. George Santayana was the famous professor of philosophy at Harvard. And he said, the aim of education the aim of education is the condition of suspended judgment on everything. Condition of suspended judgment on everything. And I have my students underline the word condition. Because to me, this word means a psychological predisposition toward saying... I don't know. I don't know. You talk to certain individuals, they have answers to problems of unemployment. 
cancer, <laughs> go all the way down the line. Then you talk to an MD or a PhD, and what will he say? <laughs> the man who should know the answers. <laughs> He'll probably say, I don't know. It may unruffle us a little bit, but at least he is not assuming knowledge that he doesn't have. But the moment you and I say, I don't know, what happens? Two words dangle on. Let's see. Then you go out and find the answer. But you see what has happened in business and industry for many years. People who didn't know the answer, they assumed that they did. Or they gave a simple solution to a very complex problem. We can define it say, this is the way you solve the problem. And invariably, it's not the solution to the problem. That's the one-valued orientation. Or if we are caught in terms of a two-valued orientation, the either-or way of thinking, we say either you do it this way or that way. Notice the structure of our language that has handcuffed us into having either one or the other of an answer. You either do it this way or this way. When the real answer or the best answer was which? Neither. <laughs> Very often to a solution to a problem is neither this way or this way. It may be a third or a fourth or a fifth alternative, right? But if we use the one-valued orientation of thinking, this is the way you do it. This is the way an autocratic executive used to operate 30, 40 years ago. But we know today that the dogmatic autocratic president or, do, uh, or executive cannot run a company that way. Because the human being is not the way he was 30, 40 years ago. He doesn't take directions that way as well as he did 40 years ago. There are other ways of handling people, and it's not by being dictatorial or dogmatic. We need more of a democratic way of getting opinions from them, etc., if you're going to motiv motivate people, and we will talk more about that. So the important kind of way of thinking for you and I is the symbol reaction. The pause, the delay, the analysis. And what I want you to do now, in fact, let me ask a question before uh, we uh, conclude this. How can you apply this principle? Are there applications in your job? Do you find people who are notoriously signal reacting? Do you? And do they get into problems? They get to conclusions? Now, the reason I put this at the beginning of my seminar and communication classes, because it is the signal reaction that leads into all other kinds of problems, communication and behavioral. If you and I can only learn to pause, to delay, to analyze, I'm only talking about five seconds. That's enough. Then something happens when your way of behaving. You don't get into the communication problems. You don't have the communication failures that you otherwise do. You don't have the bad human relations with others. You stop jumping to conclusions, etc. Proper evaluation will follow if you manifest a symbol reaction. And I have so many examples here of ignorance and stupidity. Do you remember the Orson Welles broadcast in 1938? This was a series of signal reactions. And this is more meaningful today. If Russia would like to overcome us, what do you think is the best way that they can do it with? Panic? Right? And this is what we are concerned with here. We can talk about panic all over the place. Panic in fires, panic in, in, in service. Here I have a, a, an empirical analysis. Creativity means careful analysis. I have so many uh, things in my research files that shows that if you want to find solutions to your problems, take a little time, a little more time at the outset. And then you will not be floundering in your inferences or false assumptions. You know the kind of a guy who acts in terms of signal reactions all the time? They always have the answers, and invariably the answers are false, right? They are inferences. They are assumptions. And boy, do they get you into trouble. They get themselves into trouble. They get your company into trouble. This is why we all need to be conditioned in terms of a symbol reaction. Now, before we conclude this first barrier to effective communication, the signal reaction, let us list five conclusions. Number one, 
When we behave in terms of signal reactions, we are copying animals in our responses. We are reducing the human level of response to the animal level. Number two, most of the misevaluations start with the signal reaction. Signal reactions tend to produce misevaluations, or misevaluations follow from signal reactions. Number three, when we do not orient our lives by symbol reactions, we do not observe the world of reality. We tend to have an immature and superficial perspective and understanding of things. We do not take time to observe, analyze, and understand. Number four, the signal reaction leads toward ignorance or lack of knowledge about many things. Therefore, our decisions have a lower degree of probability or predictability. And number five, signal reactions not only lead toward misunderstandings, conflicts, and confusions, but they may lead toward injurious actions against others. Now, for the first time, we see an ethical or a moral principle coming into play. Our tendencies to behave in terms of signal reactions may hurt others, too. All right, let's go into the second principle, because these are all interrelated. Do we have a uh, light switch here, uh, Jim, or...? No, no, is there, is there one? Well, let's, let's just assume that there's a light switch here. I don't offhand see one. Here's a light switch, and all the lights are on. And uh, the, the light switch is connected with the lights, etc. Now, it is up. If I push the light switch down, will these lights go off? Pardon? Ordinarily? <laughs> what would you have said at 7 o'clock? Are you learning? Is this one of the causes of accidents in construction, Ray? What I'm talking about? And it's so practical, anybody can learn it. It's so practical in many areas. All right. Can we make a statement of fact that if I push the switch down, the lights will go off? No. When you're climbing up a ladder, can you make a statement of fact that that ladder will hold you? But do people climb up the ladder as if? <laughs> It will hold them. See, this is the human error that leads to misunderstanding. And it may be as subtle as that. Korzybski in Science and Sanity talks about when he came over here from Europe, he was crossing the ocean on a boat, and he was going to sit down in a chair. Now, you and I, in terms of the verbal definition of a chair, what is the verbal definition of a chair? That which holds you, right, when you sit down? That's the verbal definition. But sometimes the empirical, nonverbal definition ain't the same as the picture inside of our heads. So most of us, wouldn't it be crazy if it did break? Because <laughs> I'm going to sit down as if it's going to hold me all the time, which is what we do. Then we get hurt. But Korzybski was conscious of his assumptions, conscious of projecting strength into this chair, just as some individuals are not conscious of projecting safety into the the barrel of a revolver when they're playing Russian roulette. Aren't they assuming certain things? And so Korzybski sat down in the chair, kind of, kind of gingerly, and the chair broke from under him. But he didn't hurt himself because he was conscious of what he was doing. Now, I'm not saying that we should do that all the time. But what I'm saying is this, that accidents are created because of jumping to conclusions, arguments, disagreements because of the false assumptions. Can you make a statement of fact that I have money in my pocket? No. Not much. <laughs> Again, what would you have said at 7 o'clock? Yes. Can you make a statement of fact, can we make a statement of fact that if I push the switch down, the lights will go off? No? Wouldn't anyone say yes? Or am I creating skeptics in all of you? <laughs> now, this is good to a degree, as we will see. Based on predictability, yes. Would you bet on it? Yes. yes. Can you make a statement of fact that if you push the switch down, the lights will go off? Can you make a statement of fact 
that if you push the switch down, the lights will go off. Is it a statement of fact? It is, under the circumstances, I feel. Maybe. I feel. <laughs> you think. Yes, yes. But it is not a statement of fact. <laughs> now, what is, what is a statement of fact and what is an inference? Why are we having so much confusion? Because we are not taught the difference between the two. Let me very quickly go into this, and we will continue on with this tomorrow. But I want to leave this with you, because I want to give you enough material tonight so you can apply this in your own personal life. If it has no application for you on your job, dealing with your family, etc., then it has no value. You're wasting your time, and I'm wasting your time. But the important thing is, can you apply it to your own behavior? Now, what's the difference between a statement of fact and a statement involving an inference? By the way, although I'm going quite quickly into these, if any of you want to know more, everything is in the book in terms of further quizzes that I don't have time to give here. Now, a statement of fact is what we mean by a descriptive statement, whereas an inference is what we mean by a guess, an opinion, a belief, etc. Okay, what's the difference between a statement of fact and an inference? Number one, a statement of fact can only be made after observation. A statement of fact can only be made after you have observed something. Can you make a statement of fact that if I push the switch down, the lights will go off? All right. Now, if I push the switch down and the lights go off, then can you make a statement of fact? Yes. That's a different kind of a statement. All right. But an inference can be made anytime. Can be made anytime. Before, during, or after observation, or, as is usually the case, with no observation at all. And boy, we find this all about us. Not only with, quotes uneducated people, but I'm talking about, especially in the area of politics. Of course, this is a good political rhetoric. <laughs> yes. With the uh, test that you describe on a light switch, you still could not say it's a matter of fact, because it could also, there is a possibility of a three-way switch, in which case, pushing the light down, turn the light on. Yeah, there, there's another possibility in terms of causality. There could have been another cause. That's right. And again, we're not talking about, we can't talk about certainty either in this respect, can we? Only in terms of probability. All right, a statement of fact can only be made after observation, whereas an inference can be made any time. Now, notice here I say before, during, or after observation. Here I say after observation, so we've got to clarify that. Number two is the most important thing that you should remember. A statement of fact stays with what can be observed. Whereas an inference goes beyond observation. A statement of fact stays with what can be observed, whereas an inference goes beyond observation. All right, let me read you an example here, see if you know the difference. My mother rented a room in our house to two boys whom she did not know. 
She was a little worried at first, but in a few days she stopped fretting. They must be nice boys, she explained. They have towels from the YMCA. <laughs> All right, make a statement of fact about this. Anyone? And you'll see how difficult it is if you don't have training in this. Anyone at all? They're in possession of towels from the YMCA. Is that a statement of fact? Is it? How do you know they came from the YMCA? Doesn't that go beyond what you can observe? Doesn't that go beyond the facts? Yes, it does. As we will see, and if you read further in my book, most of what you and I do is purely inferential. But this is why we have difficulties because we act on our inferences as if they were statements of fact. We don't check our inferences. Now, if you assume that your inferences are factual, you don't have to check them, right? You just go ahead and behave. For example, this situation here. A well-filled bus was proceeding down a Boston thoroughfare when a truck cut sharply into its path and only the bus driver's quick wits and action prevented disaster. Pale and shaken, he voiced his estimate of the vanishing truck driver's character, origin, and mode of life in words appallingly stark. <laughs> then, remembering the audience at his back, he turned to face them. A little white-haired woman forestalled his apology. My congratulations, she said, upon an admirable presentation of what we may reasonably assume to be the facts. <laughs> One situation, but two different ways of behaving. And when you and I act on our inferences or assumptions as if they were factual, then we get into difficulty. Do you know of some guys who walk across the street this way? Do you? They're certain that they're going to get across. If you're in the realm of the factual, it's fine to have the assumption of certainty to a degree, 99% is enough for me, but not 100%. Notice what I'm saying here. Number three, in terms of a statement of fact, this approaches certainty. Whereas when you are in the inferential level that most of us are every minute of our waking day, you can only orient your life or operate in terms of low to high degrees of probability. Low to high degrees of probability. What I'm saying is this, if you want to lessen problems, you must orient your life in terms of the assumptions of probability. Not the assumptions of certainty. This is when people are demoralized, frustrated, when they operate in terms of the assumptions of certainty. They are certain that such and such, and such will happen, and if it doesn't happen, then what happens? They're frustrated and demoralized. But if you and I orient our life in terms of the assumptions of probability, you can raise the probability if you have more facts, but if you don't have very many facts, then you approach slowly. Does this mean that you should wait until all the facts are in and making a decision? Not at all. You and I still have to go ahead. Although we have very few facts, perhaps a low degree of probability, but we go ahead and we behave with the assumptions of a low degree of probability. We still have to go ahead, but you're not hurt. You're looking for other variables, you see. You won't be caught short or unexpected or what have you. But many businesses fail because they assume that they are going to achieve with certainty, and they don't take all of the safeguards that are necessary because there are so many variables involved. Most businesses fail because they are under uh, manned, uh, man in terms of manpower, Financially, most businesses fail because they don't have enough financial resources. There's so many variables involved in your success. Don't assume too much. 
Write that down, if you will. Don't assume too much. When we assume things greater than the facts indicate, we are falling victim to false assumptions. Keep checking your inferences. Keep checking your assumptions. And notice in terms of probability. Orient your life in terms of probability, not in terms of the assumptions of certainty. What I'm saying is this, and I'll make a generalization. The assumption of certainty is a misevaluation. If you orient your life in terms of the assumptions of certainty, you're going to have problems. In fact, Einstein was asked about certainty. He said, in my opinion, the answer to this question is briefly this. As far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality.